Well, obviously, it's very alarming. You know, we're facing very significant price increases um, for both households and industry in the the coming months. Um, and we're you know at a time when we're already seeing price pressures right across the economy, um, very strong, um, including for for capital goods for um, for businesses. So this is not something we want to see when we're trying to balance you know have rising interest rates to fight those inflationary pressures, and then having this added layer. Um, if you cast your mind back to the sort of 80s when we saw these massive spikes in oil prices and the terrible what we call stagflation, rampant inflation and, and low or negative growth, you know, that's the last thing we want. Um, so we're in a bit of a precarious position at the, at the moment. And the big question, of course, is how long do the conditions that have led to these price spikes in the wholesale market continue and how much is going to flow through to, to retail markets? Well, and given that and the lessons of the past, Nikki, I wonder if you can give us a sense of what you expect to happen in, in the weeks and the months ahead. So we've already seen um, the energy market operator come in to intervene um, in some of the eastern states and to um, you know, put a price cap. Um, so, for example, the wholesale market price, which not that long ago was averaging maybe um, ten dollars a, a gigajoule, is you know would have been um, up as much as eight hundred dollars this week in the Victorian market um, based on on supply and demand conditions. So we've got to look at what are what are the things that are causing this. One, of course, is international conditions. Um, the war. On Ukraine, um, the invasion by Russia, obviously um, trying to ban um, use of Russian um, oil and gas exports by European nations in particular is putting pressure on the international market. And there's nothing much we can do about that in the short term. We've seen a couple of OPEC countries say that they'll increase oil supplies. Supplies. We probably need to see see more of, of that happen in the international market. In Australia, we've also got problems with our ageing um, coal-fired infrastructure. So we need to do more to move more quickly away from coal and reliance on gas, which is a much smaller part of the market overall, um, to, towards more renewables and renewables firmed by battery storage, um, you know, snowy hydro, um, other types of, of battery storage to, to um, get greater security of supply. If you look at South Australia, where they've got much higher um, amounts of, of renewables in their market, the price is the increase in the in the benchmark rate that we're going to see from July is a lot lower. It's still high, but it's a lot lower than it is in, say, New South Wales and Victoria, which have much greater reliance on on coal. But none of these things can be done in the short term. Um, they are long term. Of course, the trigger, the gas market trigger, which would force um, gas uh, producers on the east coast, um, particularly LNG in Queensland, to reserve supply as they do in WA might be able to help. But at the moment, this is not a supply issue. It's a price issue. And that is very hard. So the government's working on solutions. But unfortunately, probably the best thing they can do in the short term will be to actually help households with, you know, some sort of energy payment um, for the short term. And it's an important distinction that you make there about the, the trigger and the difference between supply and price, because it's often described as a bit of a, a panacea but there are also consequences to that. More broadly, uh, Nikki, what do you expect to be the impact for households that are already, in many instances, doing it tough, what cost of living pressures are mounting, and we are likely to see more and more interest rate rises throughout this year and into next as well? Yeah, well, there's no doubt that this is going to be another added pressure to households and means that they'll have less money to spend on other things and that will flow right across the economy. We know low income households spend maybe five, maybe even as much as 10% of their, their income on energy bills. Um, it's it's less for higher income households, but still sort of maybe two to 3%. So that means if that's going up by as much as, as 20%, um, possibly this year and next um, coming financial years, that means you've just plain simply got less money to spend on on other things and of course for many of these low-income households this is you know we're talking about um, energy poverty where people are um, you know getting their supplies potentially cut off most of the the suppliers have um, recourse for you to, to repay slowly over time so people who are in trouble I urge them to contact their um, energy retailer um, and we're going to all need to think about how we you know do things to make our homes more energy efficient so we use less of the stuff um, even simple things like a 
a like those snakes that you put in front of your doors to stop the draftiness. Um, you know, wearing an extra uh, layer. I've got a colleague who who wears beanies around the house all the time. But she lives in Tasmania. Um, you know, we, we've honestly silly things like that can can help us. Um, but it's as much as you can do to reduce your energy consumption in the meantime. Um, you know, that's probably one of the better things that that you can you can do where that is possible. Yeah, and just on that, yesterday I was hearing part of a campaign on ABC Radio Canberra, the breakfast presenter, Lish Fade, talking about draft proofing and how much money that can save in spite, despite the um, upfront cost. Um, look, it's just a double barrel one to end us with, Nikki. What, what should the major gas companies be doing? And what do you make of this criticism of state governments by Santos? Look, you know, I mean, I'm a climate counsellor and obviously emissions reduction is, is high on our list of priorities. It is the priority. Um, so for me, the answer is not producing more gas. In fact, that just makes things worse. You know, it's adding to, to and fueling climate change, which is, is, you know, creating these situations, you know, that we've seen um, the bushfires and Black Summer and, of course, the dreadful floods that we've seen. It exacerbates all of these natural disasters to become unnatural disasters. So more gas is not the option. I would like to see much more certainty in the market around our renewable targets, which of course with the new government we have, um, you know, it's encouraging the Treasurer is going to meet with state energy ministers with the market operator next week to think about how we transition far more quickly. And that's not just getting up more renewable energy, um, you know, wind and, and solar, which of course we can do much more quickly than, than gas or coal um, and much more cheaply. But, of course, we need to invest in, in the, the grid um, that moves that energy around. So, you know, that's going to take time, unfortunately. And as I said, as a short-term solution, I suspect we're going to have to see some, some short-term assistance for households in the form of, um, you know, government support, uh, one-off payments to households for their energy bills. But, you know, the sooner we get off fossil fuels, the better you know, all lives for all Australians will be and cheaper. You know, we have heard the CSIRO, the um, energy market operator, all the people saying it is cheaper to produce renewables. And we've seen, of course, in South Australia, where they have more of those, that the increases in, in, in energy prices will be lower. So, you know, it's a pretty obvious solution, but it does unfortunately take time. Yeah, that's the big discussion about the transition right now. Independent Economist Councillor for the Climate Council, Nikki Hartley. Thanks so much for your time this morning. Thank you very much.